thank you all for coming on this beautiful uh, April afternoon. Um, welcome to the Walt Whitman Writers Series. Today we're very fortunate to have the writer Colin McCann read from his work. McCann is the eighth writer um, for, uh, to visit St. Francis as part of the Walt Whitman Writers Series, uh, which is a series um, that uh, aims to bring writers uh, to Brooklyn um, to share their work with our students and faculty and the larger community. And the series is made possible by the generosity of Provost Tim Houlihan, so I would like to thank him for his continued support of the series. Um, I first contacted uh, Colin McCann over a year ago so uh, to ask if he could read, so it feels great that he's finally here and I'm introducing him. Though I'm not going to say very much about him beyond some bare-bone facts. Uh, McCann was born in Dublin, Ireland. Uh, he's a journalist, a teacher, and the author of seven novels, including Dancer, Zoli, and Let the Great World Spin. Um, that's pretty much all I'm going to say, because I would like to take a moment to say a little bit about the experience of reading Colin McCann. Um, I obviously love reading, that's why I'm an English professor, and I have some very fond memories of when I was young. Um, and when you get to that age where you can finally read on your own, um, and you, you know, go and you take your big book, The Hobbit, or whatever it is, and you sit on a couch and you disappear for hours, and it's this amazing experience. Um, and it's surprising, because you didn't realize it, you could do that, and so there's all this wonder connected with reading when you're younger. And so I thought, well, I'll read for my job, and 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 so I did, and I kept reading, and of course I love to read, but it loses, it loses some of its wonder, obviously, as you as you go on in life. But when I read Let the Great World Spin, I had that childlike experience again, and I hadn't had it in so long, where I entered this world, and it was like um, the beginning of the. Um, of where the wild things are, when Max goes into his room and his room turns into the forest all around him. And it was like that experience, except for it was New York City in the 1970s, and it was gritty and edgy and different and the same and wonderful. And I came in contact with these characters that were so unique, but also very familiar to me and, and so fascinating to me. And I was just gone. I was just off in this world. and. And it was such an amazing experience, and I hadn't had it in years. And when I finally, you know, came out of it, when I finished the the novel and I came back out of it, I I remembered why I was an English professor, and that was that I could understand the kind of talent that had to go into writing something like that, and I could understand that I could not write something like that, um, but that. I would be very lucky to spend my time in the company of books like Colin McCann's. So with that, here he is. Thank you. That's yours. Hello, guys. <clears throat> That's a beautiful thing to say. Thank you very, very much. Um, <clears throat> I was just down there thinking, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, two things. Um, I was going to read from uh, Let the Great World Spin um, and, and a little bit from Transatlantic, but after listening to uh, um, Athena, I said, oh, I'm just going to try and read from my brand new novel, Let the Great World Spin, throw it out there, because I haven't really uh, had a chance to truly to, to read from it yet. It comes out in, in June. Um, I was also thinking that I'm, I'm, I'm a big goggle-eyed right now, because I've been, I've been up all night. Now, you all know uh, what that means if you're a writer, right? You've been out in the town. Oh, that's how it used to be. Years and years ago, I'd be out in the town until four or five in the morning and, th and, and then get up. But no, no, last night um, I had a, an entirely different thing. I was, I, I was out cycling with my son and he came off his bicycle um, at, uh, at about seven o'clock yesterday evening. And uh, a, a fair clip, because he's, he, he's a racer and uh, he was out sprinting. And we ended up spending all night in the hospital together because he came off his bicycle. But he is all right. And I'm very glad to say he's all right. I'm very glad to be here, and and, and to think that um, you know he's going to he'll get through. Um, and I was thinking about the process of uh, you know of how we make journeys and um, 
and and the particular journeys that 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 that, that we take, whether it be a bicycle ride, um, you know, through Central Park, or something that I did many many years ago, which was a bicycle ride across the whole United States uh, for 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 about a year and a half, or whether it be um, a series of uh, transatlantic journeys, which is what um, this this new novel is about. Three transatlantic journeys in particular, uh, and I'm just going to sort of try and and uh, read from them. And then I'm going to see if I have a pop quiz to see if anybody knows how I try to tie all these different stories together. Um, so indulge me for 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 for, for a few minutes, uh, and I'll read for about uh, for about half an hour, and then um, I'd love to open it up to questions, especially to students. If there are any students got questions, um, I'd be really happy to see if if I'm um, able to able to answer. Um, a lot of time you're not able to answer. Uh, all right, so, first journey, 1919, uh, Alcock and Brown. Does anybody know who Alcock and Brown are? Anybody brave out there want to speak? They were the pilots who wound up landing in Ireland almost by mistake. Right. They, these were the, the two uh, RAF pilots in 1919 who, uh, eight years before Lindbergh, um, took the very first uh, transatlantic uh, flight. Basically what they did this in was in a boat of linen and wood and glue and a few screws and two Rolls-Royce engines that were hammering away, like the loudest Rolls-Royce engines that you can imagine. And, and um, this, these bomb bays that they took from, from um, um, they, they modified an old, an old bomber and they took the bomb bays and put huge uh, petrol tanks uh, in instead of the bombs. And these were two men who had come out of the war, uh, the worst war uh, that, that, that they could have imagined, uh, the First World War, uh, with how many million dead? I don't know. I think it's, some people say 25 million dead. Um, those numbers are cast around in extraordinary ways. But um, uh, they come out of the war and um, they decide well, they flirted with death so much, why not flirt with the idea of a transatlantic flight? Now, anybody who's a pilot will know that it's an extraordinary thing to negotiate anywhere without a gyroscope. Um, and they did not have a gyroscope, which means they did not know which way was, if they hit cloud, they would not know which was up, which was down, which was sideways. You can actually be flying upside down and think you're, you're, you're flying right way up. Um, these guys went across from Newfoundland to, uh, to Ireland, landed in Ireland, and I'll tell you how they landed later on, uh, in an open cockpit, right? Can you imagine it? An open cockpit at 11, 12,000 feet. The tip ends of their hair froze as they went across. So this is just a, um, a little piece about their, 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 how, they, uh, their, how they leave Newfoundland, Canada, and um, they've been waiting and waiting and waiting, uh, and they're carrying a linen bag of letters. A strong wind arrives from the west in uneven gusts. They are 12 hours late already, but now is the time. The fog has lifted and the long range weather reports are good. No cloud. The sky above seems painted in. The initial wind velocity is strong, but will probably calm to about 20 knots. There will later be a good moon. They climb aboard to scattered cheers, secure their safety belts, check the instruments yet again. A quick salute from the starter. Contact. Alcock opens the throttle and brings both engines to full power. He signals for the wooden chocks to be pulled clear from the wheels. The mechanic leans down, ducks under the wings, armpits the chocks, steps back, throws them away. He raises both arms in the air, a cough of smoke from the engines. The propellers whirl, the vimy is pointed into the gale, a slight upward angle to the wind. Go now, go. The waft of warming oil, speed and lift, the incredible roar. The trees loom in the distance, a drainage ditch challenges on the far side. They say nothing, no great Scott, no chin-up old sport. They inch forward, lumbering into the wind. Go, go. The weight of the plane rolls underneath them. Worrisome, that. Slower now than ever. Up the incline. She's heavy today. 
So much petrol to carry, 100 yards, 120, 170. They're moving too slow, as if through aspic, the tightness of the cockpit, sweat accumulating behind their knees. The motors strike hard, the wingtips flex, the grass beneath them bends and tears, bumping along on the ground, 250. The plane rises a little and then sighs again, jarring the soil. Good God, Jackie, lift her. The line of dark pine trees stands at the end of the airfield, looming closer, closer, closer still. How many men have died this way? Pull her back, Jackie boy. Skitter sideways. Abort. Now, 300 yards. Jesus, above. A gust of wind lifts the weft left wing and they tilt slightly right and then they feel it. A cold swell of air in their stomachs. We are rising, Teddy. We are rising. Look. A slow grade of upward, an ever so faint lift of the soul. And the plane is a few feet in the air, nosing up, the wind whistling through the struts. How tall are those trees? How many of us died? How many men fell? Brown converts the pines to possible noise in his mind. The slap of bark, the tangle of stems, the ack ack of twigs, the smash up. Hang on. Hang on, Jackie boy, the throat still tight with terror. They rise a little in their seats, as if that might unloosen the weight of the plane beneath them. Higher now, go! The sky beyond the trees is an oceanic thing. Lift it, Jackie. Lift it, for God's sake. Lift her! Here the trees, here they come. Their scarves take first flight, and then they hear the faint applause of branches below. That was a little ticklish roars Alcock across the noise. You've got to remember they were British, so they say things like, that was a little ticklish. <laughs> uh, so they get through and they spin and they come out of spins and they almost hit the ocean and they do all these things. And then uh, they, 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 they rudder south at 160 degrees. Um, and um, they finally come upon their first glimpse of land in 17 hours. If you can imagine what that was like. They still had hot tea in their, in their flasks, and they also had whiskey. Would you imagine your pilot flying with whiskey nowadays? Yeah. <laughs> He's screwing back the lid on the flask of hot tea when he feels Alcock's hand upon his shoulder. He knows before turning around that it is there, as simple as that. Rising up out of the sea, as nonchalant as you like, wet rock, dark grass, stone tree light. Two islands. The plane crosses the land at a low clip. Down below, a sheep with a magpie sitting on its back. The sheep raises its head and begins to run when the plane swoops. And for just a moment, the magpie stays in place on the sheep's back. There's something so odd that Brown knows he will remember it forever. The miracle of the actual. In the distance, the mountains, the quiltwork of stone walls, corkscrew roads, stunted trees, an abandoned castle, a pig farm, a church. And there, the radio towers to the south. 200 foot masts in a rectangle of lockstep. Some warehouses, a stone house sitting on the edge of the Atlantic. It is Clifton then, Clifton. The Marconi Towers, a great net of radio masts. They glance at each other, no words. Bring her down, bring her down. They follow their line out over the village. The houses are grey, the roofs slate, the streets unusually quiet. Alcock whoops. He shuts the engines, he angles in, he flattens the vimy out. Their helmets applaud, their hair roars, their fingernails whistle. And from out of the grass, a flock of long-billed snipe rises and soars. It looks to them like the perfect landing field. Hard and level and green. Yet what they don't notice coming down are the nearby slabs of peat that lie like cake, the sharp cuts in the brown earth, the lines of wet string that run along the banks, the triangular ricks of earth off in the distance. They miss, too, the wooden turf carts that lie weathered and rain pocked at the side of the road. They miss the angles of the slains leaning up against the carts. They miss the rushes grown long on the abandoned roads. They bring the vimy towards the ground, a flawless trajectory almost as if they could lean out and scoop the soil in their hands. Here we are. The plane suspends itself a foot from the ground. Their hearts thump in their shirts. They wait for the moment to touch, skim the top of the grass. They hit and they bounce. We're down. We're down, Jackie boy. 
but they know straight away that they are slowing too suddenly. A wheel maybe, a, a burst tire, a snap of the tail fin, no cursing, no shouting, no panic, a sinking feeling, a dip, and then they realize it's bog, not grass. That's your Irish welcome for you. <laughs> They're living roots of sedge. They're skidding across a green bog. The soil holds the weight of the plane a moment, and they skid along 50 feet, 60 feet, 70. But then the wheels dig. The earth holds, the vimy sinks, the nose dips, the tail lifts. It is as if they have been yanked backwards by surprise. The front of the vimy, it slams into the soil. The back end flips upward. Brown smashes his face on the front of the cockpit. Alcock pushes back against the rudder control bar, bends it with pure force. A shot of pain through his chest and shoulders. Good Jesus, Jackie, what happened there? Have we crashed? The silence, a noise in their heads, louder now than ever, suddenly doubled somehow, and then a relief floods up through them. The noise filters down into the rest of their bodies. Is that silence? Is that really silence? Is a racket of it slipping through their skull boxes? Good God, Teddy, that's silence. That's what it sounds like. Brown touches his nose, his chin, his teeth to see if he's intact. A few cuts, a few bruises, but nothing else. We're alive, we're perpendicular, but we're alive. The vimy sticks out of the earth like some New World dolman. The nose is buried at least two feet in the bog, the tail in the air. Crikey, says Alcock. He can smell petrol somewhere. He switches off the magnetos. Quick, out, down. Brown reaches for the logbook, the flares, the linen bag of letters. He pulls himself over the edge of the cockpit. He throws down his walking stick and it hits like an arrow in the bog below, stuck sideways in the soil. A burn in his leg as he lands. Hallelujah for the ground. It almost surprises him that it isn't made of air. A living dolman, yes. And in the pocket of his flight suit, Brown has a small pair of binoculars. The right lens is fogged, but through the good lens, he sees figures high stepping across the bog. Soldiers, yes, soldiers. They seem for all the world like toy things coming, dark against the complicated Irish sky. As they get closer, he can make out the shape of their hats and the slide of rifles across their chest and the bounce of bandolier belts. There's a war going on, he knows, but there's always some sort of war going on in Ireland, isn't there? One never knows quite whom or what to trust. Don't shoot, he thinks. After all this, don't shoot us. But they're British, he's sure of it. One of them with his camera bobbing at his chest, another still in his striped pajamas. Behind them, in the distance, horses and carts, a single motor car, a line of people coming from the town, snaking out along the road, small gray figures, and look at that, look at that, a priest in white vestments, coming closer now, men, women, children, running in their Sunday best. Ah, mass, so they must have been at mass. That's why there was nobody on the streets. The smell of earth, so astoundingly fresh, it strikes Brown like a thing he might eat. His ears throb, his body feels as if it's still moving through the air. He is, he thinks, the first man ever to fly and stand at the exact same time. The war is gone out of the machine. He holds the small bag of letters up in salute. On they come, soldiers, people, the light drizzle of grey. Ireland, a beautiful country, a bit savage on a man all the same. Ireland. And so the reason I use that word savage is a very particular reason, um, because um, in the next section, it goes back a number of years where a very famous uh, uh, African-American arrives in Ireland. And um, at the time, he was called Savage in the United States, as you know. Um, and this man is, is um, Frederick Douglass, who wrote Narrative of the Life of a Slave. Now, not a whole lot of people know that in 1845, uh, Douglass made his way over to Ireland. He went, he was still a slave, uh, he'd written his book, he'd become famous, he was a great orator, and then his owners down in Maryland had said that they were gonna come kidnap him and make a spectacle of his fame. So he, was, he went over to, uh, to England, really, uh, but did a, his first four months in Ireland as a lecture tour. And as the lecture tour unfolded, so too did the Irish famine which is really an incredible story um, and sort of untold. So I'm going to read you a little bit about Mr. Douglas and uh, his quandary. Um, 
that he had um, over whether he should support the poor Irish. Ah, that's me, Chase. Sorry. I shoot my students for that, you know. They, they get kicked out. Sorry. Um, it is my clock, too. I'll pretend it's my clock. Um, I'm going to read you a little bit from, from what he actually wrote himself. Um, and then um, I'm going to uh, read you a piece that I have sort of imagined. Now, come. Mr. Douglas, I've, I fell in love with Mr. Douglas, I have to say. It is said, this is his own words, it is said that history is on the side of reason, but this outcome is by no means guaranteed. Obviously, the suffering of the past will never fully be redeemed by a future of universal happiness, if indeed such a thing is obtainable. The evil of slavery is a constant, eradicable reality, but slavery itself shall be banished. The truth cannot be deferred. The moment of it is now. So he gets in a carriage and he goes south. Uh, just over the Barrow River, he's with his Irish publisher, whose name is Richard Webb. Just over the Barrow River, they took a wrong turn. They entered wild country, broken fences, ruined castles, stretches of bogland, wooded headlands, turf smoke rose from the cabins, thin and mean. On the muddy paths, they glimpsed moving rags. The rags seemed more animate than the bodies within. As they passed, the families regarded them. The children appeared marooned with hunger. A hut burned at the side of the road. The smoke looked like it was issuing from the ground. In the fields near stunted trees, men stared balefully into the distance. One man's mouth was smeared with a brown paste. Perhaps he had been eating bark. The man watched him passively as the carriage went by and then raised his stick as if bidding goodbye to himself. He staggered across the field, a dog padding at his heels. They saw him fall to his knees and then rise again, continuing on into the distance. A dark young woman picked berries from the bushes. There was red juice all down the front of her dress as if she were vomiting them up one after the other. She smiled jaggedly. Her teeth were all gone. She repeated a phrase in Irish. It sounded like a form of prayer. Douglas gripped Webb's arm. Webb looked ill, a paleness at his throat. He did not want to talk. There was a smell out over the land. The soil had been turned. The blight had flung its rotten odor into the air. The potato crop was ruined. It's all they eat, said Webb. But why? It's all they have, said Webb. Surely not. For everything else, they rely on us. British soldiers galloped past, hoofing mud onto the hedgerows, green hats with red badges, like small splashes of blood against the land. The soldiers were young and frightened. There was an air of insurrection about the countryside. Even the birds seemed to howl up out of the trees. They thought they heard the cry of a wolf, but Webb said that the last wolf had been shot in the country a half century before. Creeley, the driver, began to whimper that maybe it was a banshee. Ah, quit your foolishness, said Webb. Drive on. But sir, drive on, Creeley. At a state house, they stopped to see if they could feed the horses. Three guards stood on the gate, stone carved falcons at their shoulders. The guards had shovels in their hands, but the handles of the shovels had been sharpened to a point. The landlords were absent. There had been a fire. The house smoldered. Nobody was allowed past. They were under strict instructions. The guard looked at Douglas, and they tried to contain their surprise at the sight of a Negro. Get out of here, the guard said. Now. Creeley pushed the carriage on. The roads twisted. Hedges rose high around them. Night threatened. The horses slowed. They looked ruined. A gout of spittle and foam hung from their long jaws. Ah, move it, cried Webb from the inner cab, where he sat knee to knee with Douglas. Under a canopy of trees, the carriage came to a halting, a creaking stop. A silence pulled in around them. They heard a woman's voice under the muted hoof shuttle shuffle. It sounded as if she were invoking a blessing. What is it? Called Webb. Creeley did not answer. Move it, man, it's getting dark. Still, the carriage did not budge. Webb snapped the bottom of the door open with his foot, stepped down into the inner cab. Douglas followed. They stood in the black bath of trees. In the road, they saw the cold and grainy shape of a woman. She wore a gray woolen shawl and the remnants of a green dress. She had been dragging behind her a very small bundle of twigs attached to a strap around her shoulders, pulling the contraption in her wake. 
On the twigs lay a small parcel of white. The woman gazed up at them, her eyes shone. A high ache tightened her voice. You'll help my child, sir, she said to Webb. Pardon me? God bless you, sir, you'll help my child. She lifted the baby from the raft of twigs. Good God, said Webb. An arm flopped out from the bundle. The woman took the arm back into the rags. For the love of God, my child's hungry, she said. A wind had risen up. They could hear the branches of the trees slapping each other around. Here, said Webb, offering the woman a coin, but she did not take it. She bent her head. She seemed to recognize her own shame on the ground. She's not had a thing to eat, said Douglas. Webb fumbled in a small leather purse again and held out a sixpenny piece. Still the woman did not take it. The baby was clutched to her chest. The men stood rooted to the spot. A paralysis had swept over them. Creeley looked away. Douglas felt himself become the dark of the road. The woman thrust the baby forward. The smell of death was overpowering. Take her, she said. We cannot take her, ma'am. Please, your honours, take her. But we cannot. I beg you a thousand times. God bless you. The woman's own arms looked nothing more than two thin pieces of rope gathering upwards towards her neck. She flopped the child's arm out again and she massaged the dead baby's fingers. The inside of his wrists were already darkening. Take her please, sir, she's hungry. She thrust the dead baby forward. Webb let the silver coin drop at her feet, turned, his hands shaking. He climbed up on the wooden board beside Creeley. Come on, he called down to Douglas. And so Douglas has this terrible dilemma. Does he look after his own three million people who are back in, in, in the United States of America who were enslaved? Or does he speak out on behalf of um, the poor Irish? And uh, th this is where his dilemma sort of comes to, comes to the fore. Because he, you have to imagine that he's a 27-year-old you know, um, man and, and he's quite attractive and all the Victorian women in Ireland like him and he wants this position of power but he also is, tries to think about um, all, the, all this other stuff. And he meets a young woman called Isabel Jennings and he actually stays in her house with her family. He walked along, he walked along the River Lee, his hands clasped behind his back. It was a new walk for him, large and public, the attitude of a thinking man. He enjoyed the pose, he found it conducive to the idea of himself. He heard the clopping of a horse behind him on the cobbles, a soft sound of a harness creaking. Isabel descended the horse and walked alongside him, her hand careful at the horse's neck, sheen of sweat on the animal's body. Barges piled along the river, corn barges, barley barges, cattle barges, salt barges, pig barges, sheep for slaughterhouses further down river, firkins of butter, oatmeal, flour bags, egg boxes, baskets of turkey, canned fruit, bottled soda and minerals. They watched the river of food in silence. Gulls busied themselves behind the boats, swooping every now and then to claim what they could. They walked along by a merchant marine shop, a bookseller's, a tailor shop. Further down the quays, she pulled a horse, the horse close to her, as if it might offer protection. I could not find her. Excuse me? That woman you met upon the road, she said. I could not find her. For a brief moment, he was not sure what Isabel was talking about, an incidental skim of words across the surface of the day, but then he caught himself and he said it was a great shame, but he was sure that the child was buried by now. You did what you could, said Isabel. He knew it was not so. He had done nothing at all. He had borne witness and he had stayed silent. There's nothing worse, she said, than a small coffin. He juggled the words in his mind for a moment. He nodded. He liked her. He thought of her increasingly these past few days as a younger sister. It was odd to think so, her green eyes, her awkward walk, the rustle of her humble dresses. But that's what she was. She was sisterly, hovering, curious, intrusive. She explored new ideas with him. There were few limits. What did he think of the notion of Liberia? What was the gulf between revenge and justice? Did he have a plan with Garrison to send the money back from churches that embraced slaveholders? She was quieter when the talk returned to what was happening around them. She stopped mid-sentence. She worried the bracelet on her left arm. She gazed into the distance. Her voice caught. There was enough food in the land to feed Ireland three or four times over, she said. It was being shipped across to India, China, the West Indies. The exhaustion of empire. She wished there was something she could do about it, but the truth could not be preserved by silence. 
Her own family had warehouses full of food further down the river, bottles of vinegar, stocks of yeast, malting barley, even crates of fruit jam. But it could not be given away. There were laws of customs and issues of ownership. There were other complexities too. Business alliances, extended contracts, taxation, the demands of the poor, self-reliance, the creation of moral illusions. It struck him that Isabel carried the wound of privilege. Perhaps then he did also. He leafed through the New Testament. From everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And yet, if he himself spoke out on behalf of the poor Irish, what would happen? What language could he create for this? To whom would he speak? The politics still confounded him. Who was Irish? Who was British? Who was Catholic? Who was Protestant? Who owned the land? Whose child stood roomy-eyed with hunger? Whose house was burned to the ground? Whose soil belonged to whom and why? The simple way to see it was that the British the simple way to see it was that the British were Protestant, the Irish were Catholic. One ruled, the other lay underfoot. But where did Webb fit in and where did Isabel fit in? He would gladly have aligned, allowed himself to align with his, the desires of freedom and justice. But it was to his own known cause that he had to remain entirely loyal. Three million slaves. He could not speak out against those who had brought him here as a visitor. There was only so much he could take upon himself. He had to look to what mattered. What was beyond toleration was the ownership of man and woman. The Irish were poor, yes, but they were not enslaved. He had come here to hack away at the ropes that held American slavery in place. Sometimes it withered him just to keep his mind steady. He was aware that the essence of proper intelligence was the embrace of contradiction, and the recognition of complexity was to be balanced against the need for simplicity. He was still a slave, fugitive. If he returned to Boston, he could be kidnapped at any time, taken south, strapped to a tree, whipped his owners. They would make a spectacle of his fame. They tried to silence him for many years already. No longer, no longer. He'd been given a chance to speak out against what had held him in chains, and he would continue to do so until the lynx lay in pieces at his feet. And he thought he knew now what had brought him here the chance to explore what it felt to be free and captive at the same time. It was not something even the most aggrieved Irishman could understand, to be in bondage to everything, even the idea of one's own peace. His body, his mind, his soul had for years served only for the profit of others. His own, he had his own people to whom he was pledged, three million. They were the currency of his freedom. What weight would he carry if he tried to support the Irish too? Their agonies, their ambiguities. He had enough of his own. The barges passed, a river of food afloat. The sun went down over the slate rooftops of Cork. And that's Mr. Douglas. And the very last piece I'll tell you about the par part of the puzzle is the great Senator George Mitchell from Maine, uh, who went across to Ireland and negotiated our peace process in 1998. It's a long section examining the morality and the, the contradictions of that too. But those three stories all sit side by side. Um, and then the, the, the stories that link them all together are the stories of these Irish women who go back and forth to America. So the whole novel sways back and forth like a, I don't know, maybe put you to sleep, like <laughs> yeah, a thing. But um, I love Senator George Mitchell. I have great time for him. I think he's one of the most amazing politicians of the past 25 years. And he put our peace process in place. And he went over and like, got all these flights back and forth, back and forth, and listened to us, the Irish, talking and talking and talking, and telling them our history over and over again. They did this to us, and they did that to us, and they kicked us here, and we kicked them there, and they raped us here, and they murdered us here. Endlessly, for two years. And he just sat there with his, with his hands folded over one another. And then he struck, and he said, okay, we need an agreement now. And he did, he got an agreement. Um, in, uh, but what was it like to be that man? I, try, I tried to think, what was it like to be that person, to be over there and have these people flinging these words at you over and over and over again? And everyone knows the Irish know how to fling a word or two. Some good ones and some bad ones at the same time. So this is just a half page, um, and it's a, a metaphor for, for the piece, and then I'll sort of open things up uh, to questions or comments or whatever it happens to be. I have to make sure I didn't go on too long. Did I go on too long? Uh, isn't it terrible we don't have watches anymore these days? That's okay, good, good, good time, okay. 
It is as if in a myth he has visited an empty grain silo. In the beginning, he stood at the bottom of the silo in the resounding dark. Then several figures gathered at the top of the silo. They peered down and they shaded their eyes and they began to drop their pieces of grain upon him. Words. A small rain at first, full of vanity and history and rancor, clattering in the emptiness around him. He stood and let it sound metallic until it began to pour. And the grain took on a different sound and he had to reach up and keep knocking the words aside just to get a little space to breathe dust and chaff in the air all around them from their very own fields. They were pouring down their winnowed bitterness and in his silence he just kept thrashing, spluttering, pushing the words away, a refusal to drown. But what nobody noticed, not even himself, was that the grain kept rising and the silo filled and he kept rising with it and the sounds grew different word upon word, falling around him, building beneath him and now at the very top of the silo, he has clawed himself up and he has dusted himself off and he stands there equal with the pourers who are astounded by the language that lies beneath them. They glance at each other. There are three ways down from this silo. They can fall into the grain and drown. They can jump off the edge and abandon it or they can learn to sow it very slowly at their feet. Thank you. So that's what we did. We we we, we sort of slow. We, we sewed our piece um, at our, our at our feet. There's a lot of stuff on the internet about the um, about the the um, uh, the flight that that they made. There's also some books that they wrote themselves, and there's a lot of uh, talk about who was telling the truth and who was not telling the truth. And uh, and ah, oh, that's so much better. Thank you. Um, who? Oh yes. Now I feel like there's the light. And and and. You know, there's this rumor that, that, that uh, Brown, at one stage, when they hit snowstorm, that Brown at one stage got up out of his seat and walked along one of the wings um, and, and uh, rubbed the snow off an intake valve, which would have meant that at 11,000 feet, he was above the Atlantic, like, on a wing walking, you know? Uh, and, uh, well, first of all, the gauge wasn't out on the wing. Uh, there's no way that he could have done it. And he talked to any pilots that they, 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 they say, it was, and, and wing walkers or gymnasts or any, it was, it was really, that was absolutely impossible. But, um, you know, some of that came from the confusion of Brown's own account um, of, his, uh, of his thing later on. Alcock died six months after the flight uh, on his way to Paris, tragically. Um, Brown also tragically, like, sort of, like, became a spectacle of disintegration. His own son went to war and became a pilot and died in the Second World War. He drank. And, 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 you know, and from this great human moment, um, there were all these ruins that scattered all around it. For me, I had to go back in, and then I, I, I tried to recreate uh, as much as possible. And then I gave it to the guys in the National Science Museum in, in, in Britain. I gave it to any pilots that I knew. I went and flew a, pl a plane myself. I learned how to fly a plane. Um, and try to figure out what, 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 what it might, might have been like. But I'm not really a pilot. And mostly it's all about language and, um, and trying to get, find the right word for the right, for, 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 for the right phrase. And it's fun too. That's the great thing about writing is that, that, that you, can, like, you can write towards what you want to know and, and you can discover things that, 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 that you didn't know about yourself. Um, but you try to get it right. And in the end, the guys in the National Science Museum said that the, the, the account, the fictional account, the untrue account, is the, the truest account that they've come across uh, yet. But uh, there's plenty of stuff in that particular chapter, including fictional characters that, that they're just hokum, you know, like things that are made up, uh, like the sort of sandwiches that they ate and things like that. So you try to, the, the, the real answer is that you try to remain true to the texture of the time and give people, give, give people an idea. And then they can walk in your shoes or walk in somebody else's shoes and then they can make their own idea uh, up about it. Because I'm not interested in being the sort of novelist who tells you what to think. I'm much more interested in allowing people to think and then they make up their own mind, which I think is a more dignified way to go about it. 
So um, in the novel Let the Great World Spin, there's like um, there's an Irish guy who talks about his brother Car Corrigan, who's who's a monk. It's followed by a woman on Park Avenue, uh, you know, uh, who lives on 75th and Park, rather fancy. Um, although I have to tell you that I, for my sins, I also live on the Upper East Side. I'm the least cool writer. In, all the cool writers live in Brooklyn. That's like. <laughs> Uh, and that's a terrible thing. Uh, but um, and then there's a um, a woman who's an artist. Then there's a um, there's a 38-year-old hooker, uh, African-American hooker under the major Deegan. Uh, there's, in other words, there, there, there's lots and lots and lots of different voices um, there in in that particular book. Some of them third person, some of them first person, some of them uh, sort of blended. And um, the answer to your question is. I don't know. <laughs> In the sense that that, that 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 you just like you write what you feel is going to going to be right. Um, in terms of like the, the the actual process, I I, I stay on, on each voice. I will not blend the voices. I wouldn't be able to jump from the Irish voice to the hooker and back in unless I was editing. But in the process of creation, say that the the African American hooker uh, Tilly is her name. She's 38. Um, to get her voice, I had to do a huge amount of research. I had to, like, um, I w first of all, I went to hang out with cops in the Bronx. Tried to find older cops who'd been around in the 1970s. Then I tried to see if I could find any hookers who'd been around in the 70s. Try asking that question to, 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 to like, some of the <coughs> really elegant black ladies who were, like, like sitting, there, sitting around, like, uh, not a, it was not a good idea. Uh, and then, uh, I found stuff in the library, I looked at films, I looked at, you know, all those great films from the early 70s. And then I hit pay dirt in the back of a police station uh, in the Bronx where I found boxes and boxes of rap sheets one day. And in those rap sheets, you look through them, like you find one, say, for prostitution, and then you look at her names, and she'd be called Giggles at one stage, and she'd be called Sweet Cakes at another stage, and she'd be called, you know, whatever. And then you, you begin to see a composite of, of these lives and then you'd see all the, their, their crimes and things like that. So you build up the character like that. But in the end, that doesn't mean anything because you can know everything about prostitution in the 1970s, uh, but you won't be able to make the character lift off the page. Uh, you won't be able to make them uh, necessarily real uh, until you give them a voice. Because we all have a voice. It's like music. And that's the way I, I think about it. Like, it's like Van Morrison has his own type of music. Coldplay have their own type of music, you know. Uh, Bach, whatever it happens to be, there, there are different textures of music, and each of us has that with, within us as well. So you've got to find the right music, the way your character speaks. And when you find the way that she speaks, then I think most of the truth comes out, out, out of language. But you have to have done your work beforehand for, for the language to, to, to sort of emerge. So that's how I work. And, and I'll, I spend about six months researching, a couple of months writing, and then, uh, and then I'll go back and rewrite it and rewrite it as, as, as time went along. But I kind of like it too, because it means that I can not be myself. Because I'm not really fond of being myself. I wake up in the morning, I just like look at myself and I want to roll away. <laughs> like, I have to spend 24 hours with that carcass. Uh, so it's nice to be. It's nice to be someone else. I think. I think in in a way, all of us want to be someone else. All of us desire to be someone else. That's why we we buy these magazines about movie stars and things like that. We all have a part of us. Uh, and one of the great things about being a writer is that you can actually transport yourself and be someone else. And, and it's also why we watch movies. But it's also one of the reasons why we read books too. And and books, in this respect are marvelously anti-violent in the sense that you can write about violence and you can write about the Holocaust and you can write about the famine and you can, as a reader, experience it. And it's a sort of experiential dream in that you go in and you feel the pain and you feel the hunger and you feel the, the cold and whatever it happens to be and you weep for these people sometimes, but then you can close the book and you can crawl back in under your covers and, and say, what well, boy, am I lucky to be the person that I am right now. And uh, that seems to me to be one of the great uh, ways that, 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 that we as human beings sort of uh, operate, that we can become someone else. And we're lucky um, in that respect. But we have to do more of it you know, to understand what it means to be someone else. Yeah. yeah. It's all so complicated, isn't it? I mean, I, I, I'm basically like, like, like everyone else, like sat and, and, and had, a, 
had, had a good weep watching watching those images. Um, and, and, and I wrote a little piece about it for an Italian newspaper. And basically what I said was that the, the, that the um, you know, the most enduring image that I could come across in my limited access to what was going on, because it was just a few hours afterwards, was that the paramedics were jumping in over the barricades um, to get to the people who'd been, been blown up um, behind the barricades. And um, they w had to jump through all these flags there was a South African flag that was there, there was a Korean flag that was there, there was a US flag, there was a British flag further down along, um, some flags that I didn't recognize, but I thought it was extraordinary because all these flags were from runners all over the world, um, and they, they were yanking the flags backwards and then sort of throwing them, throwing them on the ground and, and getting in to create space to look after the people there. And it seemed to me that it was just a, a, as an intentionally uh, international as what had happened at the World Trade Center. You know, the World Trade Center being that place where all these people come together and, and uh, yet on very much on American soil, very much a part of Americana, uh, like the, the Boston thing and the, and the World Trade Center, and yet it, it, an innate internationalism again, as if there's some, some sort of jealousy about, about um, you know, the international experience. And then, you know, looking at it and, and, and saying, can, can, you know, how would this, what's the line? How would this rage shall beauty hold a plea? You know, the, um, well you have to think about it. Like how can, how can, can you go on? And, but but you, just, you just must, you can't not go on. Um, and, and, and eventually somebody will make some sort of sense of it um, for us. It, it, it doesn't mean that you have to make sense and it doesn't mean that, 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 that the hope and the reconciliation is, is something that you immediately must get. But I think it's something that, that builds over time. Uh, well, one, one would hope that it builds over time, and that um, you, you know, you, you, because if you live in despair, that's what you do. You live in despair. Fair enough, grand. Live in despair, but it seems to me to be a failure of human instinct to live only in despair. You've got to get somehow beyond it. But you have to recognise that it is pretty despairing, and in the in the first place, and then and and then say, okay, so what? What what else can we? What else can we find uh, from it? I don't know what that, 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 that what else is. With Let the Great World Spin, I, I, I thought it was about grace and recovery and, and, and like dealing, dealing with it. Because people said at the end of 9-11, there was the end of history, all these things. Obviously, it wasn't the end, of, the end of history. It was the beginning of lots of new things, but it wasn't really the end, the end of history. But I hope that answers your question. I don't know if I did very well. I, one last question I thought, so I hand at the back. Thank you. It's a great question. How, how did, did Douglas reconcile the fact that did what he wanted to do was like break the... Well, first of all, he was still a slave, right? And he hadn't bought his freedom, right? So, um, and, and then the people who, who uh, held his, his who, who owned him, wanted to come up and, and kidnap him and, and bring him back down south. So they were afraid that if he stayed in Boston and that, that those areas, He'd be he'd they'd, 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 they'd take him and and some terrible fight would break out. Secondly, the British were so um, so important to the whole idea of what had happened in the West Indies about uh, you know uh, a, a dozen years beforehand. Um, also, a lot of the money that was coming for the um, for, for for the abolitionist cause in the United States was coming from churches in England, Scotland. Northern Ireland and Ireland, um, and a lot of very wealthy, informed people were over uh, in, in Britain. So they thought, we'll send Douglas across, he'll go on a lecture tour, and they'll send more money back. Douglas thought, yes, I'll do that, and, and I'll be safe, um, and then I'll also be able to uh, sell my uh, book, Narrative of the Life of Slave, I'll make enough money, and I'll buy my own freedom back. And then I'll also be able to look after my family who are still over in the United States, his wife and kids. So there was all those complicated reasons that they felt that Douglas could go across and, and, and achieve it. And there is a very, 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 I mean, I, I love Douglas and Douglas was a hundred years ahead of his time, if, if not more. But I think that, 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 that the reason we had somebody like Senator Mitchell who was able to go across and do this, this, this act of generosity was purely because there was someone like Douglas who could plow the ground um, bef be before him. And Douglas went back in 1847 uh, and he went back a free man. I mean, isn't that extraordinary? He, 
He, he, he bought his freedom uh, while he was in England and went back to his family and then went up to Rochester and started publishing and uh, became the person, one of the great consciences of, 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 of American politics that still, I still believe exists today, that, that they still have people like that um, who are prepared to do good things because of someone, someone like Douglas. So I hope that answers your question. All right, well, thank you so much.